Okay. I want us to begin at verse 11, a very familiar story to many of us. Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 11. When you found the text, I would ask you please to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. Amen. Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 11. And the Word of our God reads in this fashion. Then he said, speaking of Jesus, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, listen to this, children, this is sweet. How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. If you're so convinced you're no longer worthy to be called his son, why are you addressing him as father? I think this prodigal son had more of an understanding of the nature of his dad than he, than this story lets on. Are you following me today? He said, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But, but the father but the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. I kind of picked an unusual text today for my subject matter, but you'll see why I chose it in a few moments. I'm going to ask you, would you bow with me and pray with me? Master, today we ask that you would anoint your messenger, anoint every word that's spoken. God, let it go forth in truth and boldness. Let it touch the heart of the hearer. Let it change the mind of the unsaved. Lord, let it convert the sinner from his sinful way. And help us, God, to understand you and know you better. For we ask it all in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated. I didn't pick this story because I'm going to do a nice little tidy exegesis on the prodigal son, like most preachers do when you read this particular portion of Scripture and when they preach from this particular text. But anybody that knows me knows that I have a very unusual preaching style, so chances are I'm not going to approach things from the same angle everybody else is accustomed to approaching them. I want us to understand something from this story. And it's simple. We can learn it in three minutes flat. It won't take too long at all. This boy left the house a son, and he came back a son. Are you hearing me today? When he left his father's presence, he was a son. When he came back to his father, he was still a son. When God has called you out and brought you into this wonderful truth and saved you by his grace, you are a son indeed. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter whether you're outside or inside, you're still a son. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It didn't matter whether he was home or whether he was away from home. When 
when he was looking at the pig swamp, he still said, in my father's house. <laughs> he knew where his identity lay. He knew that daddy was somewhere else. He knew that even though he wasn't in the father's house, he was still the father's son. Hallelujah. In John chapter 8, verses 31 through 36, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed. And were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committed sin or unbelief is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. If you recall last week in my message, I made a point of this very same scripture. And I said that Jesus Christ might very well have simply said that if the Son has made you a son, you shall be a son indeed. Hallelujah. Because you see, we have not been called like I said last week, we've not been called to be servants, but we've been called to be children. Hallelujah. We've not been called to serve, but we have been adopted by God Almighty into His family. And we therefore abide in the house of God today as children. Hallelujah. Now in 1 John chapter 3, beginning at verse 1 through verse 3, John writes something beautiful, something wonderful, something that many churches like to gloss right over because it doesn't suit their religiosity. It doesn't suit their, their law-abiding nature. But the Apostle John declares in John, 1 John chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, he said, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. He's talking about the Father. He said, therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. What did John also say in his gospel Chapter 1, when he said he was in the world and he created the world and the world knew him not. So John was saying the world had an opportunity to know the Father, but it didn't know him. It did not recognize him. He said and it won't recognize us either because we now have been grafted into that tree. But now listen to this. John goes on to say, Beloved, now we are the children of God. Now we are the children of God. This isn't something that's going to happen later. This is not a promise that we're waiting for. John says, Now we are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. Even though we are children of God today, we are not all that we're going to be. He said we haven't even been shown yet everything God's going to do for us. He goes on to say, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. You see, Mother, tonight we are the children of God. But that doesn't mean we're everything that God has planned for us. There's more to come. Thank God 
there's more to come. It only gets better and better and better. But I got news for you. This is the best news that we could ever receive as people of God. This is the best news that could ever be preached in a church house because I've got news for you. What, what John is letting us know now in 1 John chapter 3 is that God is not offended by your humanity. And some of you have heard me say that before. God is not offended by your humanity. John said, no, sir. Now we are the sons of God, but it does not yet appear what we shall be. Things are one day going to change when Jesus appears in the eastern sky and the saints of God are lifted out of their graves. Things are going to change, hallelujah. But until then, we're still the sons of God. Abraham was merely the servant of God. A servant does his job, dies, and his connections with and affiliations to the family are severed. But a son is always a son. So by reason of the fact today that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, He alone is able to emancipate the slaves and ensure their freedom. Hallelujah. Because He's a son. And the son has the power to do this. And a servant does not. So those who rely upon the law of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, those who rely upon the teachings of Moses, I've got news for you. They were only servants. They could not set you free. They didn't have the power nor the authority. John chapter 8, 58. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Hallelujah. A reference to the name that was given to Moses on top of Mount Sinai when Moses said, Whom shall I tell them is sending me into the land of Egypt to bring the people of God out? And God said, Tell them that I am have sent you. And here stands Jesus before the people of Israel declaring, Before Abraham was, I am. He didn't say, I was. He said, I am. Hallelujah. A declaration of his deity. Who? As children of God today, what has God called us to? I don't know what kind of parents you had. It doesn't matter what kind of parents you have. If you try to equate God with your earthly parents, you're going to make some humongous mistakes. God don't look like your daddy. Amen. He don't sound like your mom. Come on now. When God adopts you into his family, i got news for you. You're being adopted. Oh, you know, sometimes we feel like we're dishonoring our parents if we say anything bad about the way that we were raised or the way they did things. But children, I want you to know, when you get adopted into God's family, you've got the best situation that ever was had. Because Jesus said, once you're brought into this thing, you're free, free indeed. Hallelujah. You're not just free in word. You're not just free in principle. He said you're free indeed. Hallelujah. If I adopt you by the spirit of adoption, whereby you cry out of the Father, and you become a son and a daughter of God, child, you're a son indeed. Hallelujah. And don't let the devil tell you any different. Let me tell you the benefits of being adopted into God's family. Let me tell you what it is to be a son indeed. A son indeed is free from condemnation. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, There is therefore now no condemnation, no condemnation, to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. I've got news for you. Paul was talking about the Old Testament 
law written by Moses. He said the law of the spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. Because that's all the law of Moses was, was the law of sin and death. He said for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. He didn't say you had to walk perfectly. He didn't say you couldn't stumble. He didn't say you couldn't trip. He just said that those who walk after the spirits, even mother, if you stumble your way through some time and you make a goof up here and again, I've got news for you. You're still a child of God and there's still no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. The Lord is never looking down at you with a condemning word because of something you've done or something you said. That's not how your heavenly Father operates. Condemnation is destructive. And I've got news for you. Our God is a constructed God. Let me tell you what else we're free from. We're free from carnality. Reading again from Romans chapter 8, this time beginning at verse 5 through verse 10. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. What is it to be after? What is it to live after the flesh? What's the difference between living after the flesh and living after the Spirit? Well, it's very simple. You've got people out there today who are living to work rather than working to live. They spend every minute of every day trying to figure out how they can get another dollar in their banking account and how they can uh, get somebody else to lose out so they can win in business. How they can somehow, they don't care how dirty their deeds get in order to get where they're going. It doesn't matter, but they're convinced that this life is all they have and therefore they try to make everything they can count in this life. But those of us that live after the Spirit know, come on now, there's more to this life. So we lay up our treasures on the other side where dust and moth doth not corrupt. Hallelujah. And therefore we do think that those people will look at us and say, well, they give too much. They give too much away. They, they put too much money in the offering plate. They, they do too much of this and they do too much of that because it doesn't. It doesn't work with their fleshly system, their carnal system. But in God's spiritual economy, we know, give and it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Shall men give unto your bosom. You see, so we're operating on a whole different economy. Why? Because we're not walking after the flesh. We're walking after the spirit. We're not walking according to carnality. We're walking according to spirituality. Are you hearing me today? Amen. We're not walking a carnal walk because we're following a spiritual walk. And the spiritual walk don't always look right in the natural, does it? Some people see you do things the way you do things say, Lord, that don't look right to me. Well, of course not, because you're looking at it through carnal eyes. I'm looking at it through God's eyes. Hello now. Well, you're, you're not going to get anything out of that deal. If you help those people, they're going to just turn around and bite you on the backside. And it's not going to help you in the least. You're not going to get anything out of it. Oh, yes, I will. I helped them out of the goodness of my heart. I was trying to do what I felt God would have me to do. You think I'm going to go without a reward? No, honey, I won't go without my reward. It may not come from them, but I'll get it. For to be carnally minded is death. You live in this life as if this life is all you have, it's death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. 
for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his, and that Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. We are free from condemnation as a son indeed. We are free from carnality, thinking and acting and living as though this life is all there was. But you know what? We're free from death. As a son indeed, we're free from death. The Word of God declaring again in Romans chapter 8, now reading verses 11 through 13. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. God has promised a resurrection for those who believe and obey His gospel. We're free from death. Death has no power over the children of God. Amen. It has no power over a child of God. I've got news for you. God has given us today the freedom to live as sons and daughters. You say, well, Brother Morrow, I, I hear what you're saying, but that sounds like what you've just been saying. I, I don't really understand. Listen. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, Romans chapter 8, again, beginning at verse 14. They are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You know what Abba, Father translates in modern English? Daddy. When you run to God, you've been adopted by Him. Like a little child, you're able to run up to Him and say, Daddy. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The word sufferings here that Paul uses in writing to the Romans comes from the Greek word pathema, meaning something undergone hardship or pain, an emotion or influence, affection, affliction, motion, suffering, in a nutshell, our human condition and experience. Paul is simply saying that our human condition and our experience as human beings cannot even begin to compare with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Hallelujah. Every experience, every hardship, every pain, every emotion, every influence is going to be exchanged by God in the resurrection with something far more glorious than we could ever begin to imagine. Our humanity and mortal failings do not come as any surprise to God. They are not an afterthought or an ignored issue. The Lord knew as they hung on Calvary's tree that each and every believer who would embrace this glorious, wonderful gospel in truth would become, in fact, a child of God. And as a child of God, they would have every right 
to the blessings and privileges of sonship. Children today, we have been adopted into God's sacred family through the blood of the Christ of Calvary. Even as an earthly father loves his children, biological or adopted, without regard to their feelings, their weaknesses, and their frailties, even so our Heavenly Father has assured us that He will always love us, never leave us, and not be prevented from acting as our Father, even when our behavior at times is not consistent with that of a son. That prodigal's father could have had a lot to say when that son came home. Where have you been? What you been doing? Who you been doing? Were they male or female? Where did all my money go? But look at the story. What do you read? I read where the father didn't even talk to the son. Oh, that was his punishment. He didn't talk to him yet. He was too busy talking to the servant, saying, Go get this boy a ring. Go get this boy a robe. Go get this boy some sandals. My God, this is my son. And no son of mine is going to stand in my house naked and destitute. Glory to God. If he's my child, he's going to look like my child. Hallelujah. I want you to know today, God has said, he has called you and I to sonship, to daughtership. He has called us to be His children. He has adopted us by His Spirit. And He says, children, don't you ever forget that as a child of God, you are free from condemnation. You are free from carnality. You're not living under the same law that these people out here in a dog-eat-dog -dog world are living under. He said, you're free from all of that. He said, you're free from death. While most people are living their lives so frantically because they see the grave as their end, you see it as a time for a new beginning. Hallelujah. What a way to live. Makes me think of that old song we used to sing in Church of God. Oh, what a glad and glorious thought that comes to me. I'll live on. Yes, I'll live on. Through eternity I'll live on. What a way to live when you got that thought in your mind the whole time. Isn't it wonderful when you can live your life and you know, I'm going to live on. This life is only just a very tiny uh, bit of a stretch. It's kind of like a runway for me to get my wings and fly. But glory to God, when I hit the grave, I'll live on. And I won't have 70 years promised to me to live out my blessing. I won't have 70 years of promise uh, given to me to live out my reward. No, honey, when I get to the end of this runway, I'm going to have all of eternity to enjoy the rewards that God gives me for the things that I've done in this life. What a way to live your life. Hallelujah. Good God, for what little bit of stupid thing you do here that might last all of a day or two or three or a year, and you're going to be able to enjoy the benefits of it throughout eternity. Hallelujah. Because we're free from death. We're free from carnality. We're free from condemnation. We're free to live as sons and daughters. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? Free to live as sons and daughters. Not as slaves, not as servants, as sons and daughters. God wants you to be His son. God wants you to be His daughter. He doesn't want you to be His slave. Oh, I got news for you. When Jesus sets you free, when you become a son indeed, you're free to be yourself. Did you hear me? I wish every transgendered believer in the world could hear me preach this today. The Ethiopian eunuch is probably one of the greatest examples of an individual 
in his flesh his condition was unchangeable. Once you castrated, you castrated. There ain't no going back. Especially in 20 or 30 A.D. He was condemned under the law, unable to enter God's holy temple, and considered unclean to the devout Jew, and according to Old Testament law, even to God. And yet in Acts chapter 8, 29, the Spirit of God Almighty is talking to Philip, and he says, you see that chariot down there? I want you to go down and talk to that man. You know why people don't understand this church and why they don't understand what I'm doing? I'll tell you why. Because just like God talking to Philip that day, God is telling me to go talk to people that you wouldn't want to talk to, that you wouldn't think God even wanted to talk to. But God gave Philip the order. He didn't just go on his own. He went because the Spirit of the Lord motivated him to go. And then in Acts chapter 8, in verses 34 through 30, uh, 38, and the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet, uh, this of himself or of some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. The eunuch was reading a portion in Isaiah. Who is he talking about? Is, it, is the author writing about himself or somebody else? And Philip said, oh no, the author was talking about Jesus. Let me tell you about Jesus. That's who he was writing about. The same one that Isaiah declared in other prophecy would be God in human form amongst men to be our Redeemer. He said, let me tell you about that Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Hallelujah. No talk of reversing his physical condition, no talk of undoing what had been done, no talk of his being unclean according to the law. No, Philip had the good news of the gospel behind him, and he said, if you believe with all of your heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they both went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. You see, when you come to God and you become His child, you're free to be yourself. You're free to be who you are. Come on now. God don't, your, your humanity don't begin to offend God. It doesn't hurt His feelings at all. He understood who you were before you ever come to Him. Let me tell you what else you're free to do. You're free to live honestly. Look at the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Had a conversation with Jesus Christ that changed her life. But there were so many things that were working against her. She was a woman. She was a Samaritan. She was a divorcee who was now living with a man. Jesus fully understood she was a woman. But she asked him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask this drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. You see, she was perfectly honest with him. She was perfectly upfront with him. She had nothing to hide from him. You're hearing me today. When the Lord asked her, go get your husband, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that thou saidest truly. Notice, 
He didn't tell her she needed to rectify the situation. She needed to change the situation. She needed to do something about the situation. But what he did was he acknowledged that he understood her situation. You become a child of God. I got news for you. God understands your situation. David the psalmist, he was living under the law. And he still wrote the words that I love in Psalm 103 when he said, He knows my frame. He remembers that I'm dust. That was under the law that David wrote that. And here we are under this great and wonderful dispensation of grace. And people still can't get it in their heads that God knows what you're made out of. So just be honest with him. We are free today to live unencumbered by religion and law. I told you this message would be good for you, Tommy, didn't I? Romans chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the Spirit, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. You're free to live apart from, separated from, delivered from religion and law. Isn't that good news? You become a child of God, I've got news for you. You listen to me now. This is a good point. I want you to take this one home with you. You let one of your kids come up to your house and throw a paintball at the side of the house. And you're going to deal with that child a whole lot differently than if one of the neighbor kids comes up and throws a paintball at the side of your house. Hello now. You're not going to call the law on your child. Did you hear my term? You're not going to call the law on your child. You're not going to sick the law on your child. No, 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 no. That's your child. Whether they do something stupid or goofy or costly or what, they're still your child. Policemen will look at you funny if you try to call them for something vandalous that a child of your own did to your property, wouldn't they? Why? Well, parents don't call the law when their own children vandalize their own property. That just doesn't happen. I got news for you. Jesus said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more does your heavenly Father know how to give good gifts unto them to that? There's really a greater principle involved here. He's saying, if you all, as human beings, think that you can do such nice things when really at the very root of your nature it's no good, he said, for heaven's sake, somewhere you've got to understand that your heavenly Father is so much more capable of doing great and wonderful and nice and loving and gracious and merciful things. You see, we're called to live as children. You can throw that paintball upside of the house of God, and you know what? God ain't going to call the law on you because you're free from the law. Why are you free from the law? Because you're his child. Did you hear me? You're free from the law because you are his child. And as his child, he will deal with you differently that he will deal with the one who would do the same exact thing that is not a member of his family. You know what else God assures his children today? He assures us freedom to enjoy life. How do you like that? Do you know, Mother, that God has said that we have the right to enjoy this time we have here? John 10 and 10, Jesus said, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. 1 Timothy 6 and 7, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, listen to this next phrase, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Amen. You come to God and you, you become a child of God. All of a sudden the world is your oyster. 
You're able to enjoy everything. Everything's yours to enjoy. Why? Because your father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Come on now. I got news for you. Your father owns the cattle. He owns the hills. Hallelujah. You then have the right to enjoy all things. Well, Brother Morrow, surely God didn't mean, and I'm going to really press it to the limit today. Surely he didn't mean I could enjoy my sex life. So why couldn't you? Amen. He's given you all things to enjoy. Are you raping anybody? Are you molesting any children? Are you hurting anybody? Are you, you know, I tell people, and I don't try to sound ugly, but if y'all want to tie each other up, swing off the chandeliers and yodel, that's your business. I don't care. I don't want to hear about it. What's done in private is done in private for a reason. And that's where it needs to stay. That's just good taste. Amen. To just keep your private business to yourself. But if y'all enjoy each other's company by doing a <laughs> trapeze artist routine, well then by all means, pull on the tights and get to swinging. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> food can I enjoy food well why can't you God's given you all things to enjoy amen I, can I dress nice can I enjoy clothing yes what did, what did we read what did Paul write to Timothy did he say that you couldn't enjoy these things no he said what you can't do is trust in them <laughs> He said, tell the rich not to trust in uncertain riches. He said, God's given us everything to enjoy, but don't put your confidence and your trust and your hope and your future and your plans all in your stuff. Enjoy it, but don't trust in it. If it's gone tomorrow, you won't be any sadder for its absence than you would be if you'd never had it. Why? Because you never trusted in it. You never never put that great of stock in it. It was nice while it was there. Amen. I've owned some, I've owned, I've uh, driven some nice cars. I've had some nice apartments and what have you. You know what? I enjoyed them while I had them. I'm enjoying the one I'm in while I have it. But if the time ever comes, I need to move. I need to move. What do you do? I'm not going to put my trust in things. I've got someone to trust in. Amen. And he is a loving and gracious Heavenly Father. I'm closing up right now, I promise. I hope you get the concept tonight of the message that I'm trying to deliver to you. If you have accepted the invitation to become a son and daughter of God, then child of God, you have been made a son indeed. And as a son indeed, you are free to enjoy life. You are free to live unencumbered by religion and law. You are free to live honestly. You are free to be yourself. You are free from death, from carnality, from condemnation, and you are free to live as sons and daughters. How many of us think of God, honestly, we use the term Father, but how many of us really think of Him as a loving, gracious, heavenly Father? Amen. A lot of us don't. You get to talking about religion, and the first thing, you know, some people rise, get to rolling. You get to thinking they're Linda Blair and the Exorcist. Because, oh boy, religion... You know why? Because their concept of God is anything but a loving and gracious and giving Heavenly Father. Am I telling the truth tonight? I know I am. And that's where the line of difference is wrong. Why people can't understand sometimes why moral can talk about the Lord day in and day out. Because I tell you what, He ain't been nothing but wonderful to me. 